All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nudging Organ Donation, Tools to Encourage Organ Availability. My name is Carmel Shahar, and I am the Executive Director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am delighted to welcome you to this event. It's going to be a really interesting exploration of the levers by which we can encourage people to donate organs to save lives. The organ supply still woefully cannot meet the demand. Before I hand it over to our speakers, just a few logistics, the virtual equivalent of where is the bathroom. Towards the end of the event, we will have a moderated discussion where we invite you to submit questions. How do you submit questions, you might be asking? There are one of two ways. You can use the Zoom Q&A feature, which should be located towards the bottom of your Zoom screen, kind of close to your mute and stop video buttons. That will be monitored. You can also join us on Twitter using the hashtag nudging donation. We will be monitoring Twitter. And if you ask a question, again, using the hashtag nudging donation, we'll make sure that it gets to the moderator. The ways that you cannot ask questions, please don't try to use the chat function, as well as I know Zoom has the raise hand feature. That little blue hand is very cute, but again, that is not a way we are accepting questions. With that said, I am delighted to hand it over to the moderator and MC of this event, James Lytle who is a fellow with the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, and this event has really been his brainchild. Jim, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much. Um, in, just to set the stage, enhancing equitable access to organ transplantation remains a critical issue for the United States. It, we had a record number of 40,000 transplants in 2019, but there's over 110,000 people on the waiting list, a list that grows by one person every 10 minutes and is diminished by the death of 8,000 people every year who didn't get the organ that their lives depended on. Anything that might nudge an increase in organ donation will save lives. The Petrie Flom Center is honored to host an exploration of these issues by three extraordinary uh, experts on how we might encourage organ donation. Uh, Professor Cass Sunstein of Harvard Law School, Phil Walton from the UK National Health Service, uh, Alex Glazier from uh, the New England Donor Services, the Regional Organ Procurement Organization. We'll start with Professor Sunstein, the Robert Walmsley University Professor and the former Administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, who has literally written a book, uh, written the book on nudging, uh, namely Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness, and who has directed his unique legal and behavioral economics expertise to the organ transplantation issue. So I turn it over to you, Professor Sunstein. Thank you so much and thank you for organizing this. And it's an honor to be able to be speaking with a group of such extraordinary people who were uh, devoting their lives to trying to save other people's lives. Um, the timing of this for me personally is uh, uh, extraordinarily good notwithstanding the fact that a lot of people haven't had sleep the last days. And that's because I've spent a great deal of the last five months with Dick Thaler redoing Nudge, doing Nudge 2.0. And we've been attending very closely to trying to improve our treatment of organ donation. So this has been very much on my mind for a long time now. Uh, I'm going to start by talking about criteria for evaluation of various forms of choice architecture, and I'm going to try to exclude two of the uh, options for choice architecture and to talk lightly around the three reasonable contenders and to explore uh, uh, their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, to talk about the options, we need some criteria for evaluating choice architecture for organ donation. One is clear, what is most likely to save lives? That's self-evident as, uh, as a desideratum. The second is protection of chooser autonomy. That's a little trickier. So if we're thinking about organ donors as 
you know, people living their lives who might become organ donors uh, in a context where, and this is what I'm going to focus on, uh, they are at the end of their lives, they're basically done, and the question is whether they're going to be organ donors. What does it mean to protect their autonomy? One way of protecting their autonomy might be that their organs will not be taken without their consent. That's one. Another is their organs won't be not taken unless they've consented to having them not taken. A third might be to ask what would make them better off as they themselves judge the situation. And a fourth, which is my preferred, is what form of choice architecture is consistent with what they would do if they actually were to make a choice, if they were informed, and if they didn't procrastinate. So the preferred conception of chooser autonomy is what would they do if they actually made a choice, if they were informed and they didn't procrastinate. That's a way to protect people's autonomy. Okay, notice if you would that the two goals, protecting chooser autonomy and saving lives could be balanced in different ways. We might give decisive or overriding weight to one of the two, and many people would do that, or we could hope to damage neither, or if we couldn't do that, we might hope to damage both minimally. What I'm going to try to do in exploring the five options is to the second, that is to try to find an approach that would damage most minimally, but I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. So if you have other criteria for choosing among the, uh, the criteria for goals, uh, you can see how the analysis would go. Okay, now we're gonna march through the five. The first would be routine removal which is not something, as I understand it, that's being vigorously argued for, but it's an interesting option where the idea would be that if people have no use for their organs, uh, they're, they've, they're, they're done, uh, the route would be that they'd be available for someone who does have uh, use for them. This might well save lives. Uh, it would be good to know how many, uh, in terms of the life-saving criterion, it would get a gold star. It is a violation of chooser autonomy. On a scale of zero to 10, it gets zero. Even if 75% or higher of informed choosers making a choice would choose to be organ donors, there would be 25% or lower, a significant percentage of people whose will would be violated. That might not be prohibitive for some in a case in which we're talking about choosers who are conferring benefits on third parties. These are externalities, but note that these are positive externalities. It's not like you're asking people not to pollute, you're asking people instead to donate. And there's widespread moral objection in many countries, this seems to be the dominant view, uh, to violating chooser autonomy in that uh, uh, unmistakable sense which is to suggest that routine removal faces a public wall of disapproval and as a practical matter and legitimately, whether or not we take on board the difficult philosophical issues, legitimately that public wall of disapproval has uh, foundations. Okay, so let's put an X next to that one. The second is opt-in, which many uh, societies have, by which the choice architecture is to say, if people want to um, be organ donors, they have to say that that's what they want. In terms of saving lives, if that's unadorned, and I'll say a little bit more about what unadorned means, but let's just say nothing but opting in, uh, it is not good for saving lives. There'll probably be a very significant number of unnecessary deaths. It looks like it's respectful of chooser autonomy in the sense that there will be no don donations without affirmative consent. But in the preferred sense of autonomy, opt-in actually is not nearly as good as it might seem. That is to say that under an opt-in regime, people will do something, that is not be organ donors, which is not what they would want if they were to reflect and be informed and to make a choice. 
this isn't a criticism of our brothers and sisters in the human race. It's to say that people suffer from inattention and procrastination, which is to say they won't become organ donors, not because on reflection they don't want to, but because they don't focus on it. And that's a violation of their autonomy. So if unadorned, the opt-in regimes are very bad on the saving life scale and not very good on the chooser autonomy scale, which is to say that it gets bad grades on both. And I think we can put an X next to uh, opt-in uh, no less than, meaning with the same degree of clarity, that we can put an X next to routine removal. Okay, an approach which some countries have found congenial is an opt-out regime by which people are presumed to be organ donors. And there's a lot to be said in favor of this approach. And I wanna say what might be said on behalf of it and then raise some questions and puzzles. On the saving lives scale in principle, opt-out should save lives maybe a lot. That's an empirical question on which more in a moment, but it seems to do pretty well, certainly compared to opt-in on that scale. On the chooser autonomy scale, it has the advantage of fully respecting freedom of choice, which is to say that if it just worked, it would be good because it would do extremely well on the saving lives scale and well enough on the chooser autonomy scale. But along both dimensions, it's actually less um, clearly a winner than I would like it to be, I confess. On the chooser autonomy scale, we can see from the re reaction in the Netherlands, which had a kind of very strong negative reaction to opt in, opt out. We could see a clue about public rebellion against people being organ donors by default. And the point here is no less powerful than in the case of opt-in. Many people under an opt-out regime will be organ donors, not by virtue of a considered choice that that's what they want to be, but because of inattention and procrastination, the evil siblings of behavioral bias who are uh, ensuring that people aren't attending to an issue which were they to attend to it, they might in non-trivial numbers opt out, but they don't. Okay, those don't seem to be devastating problems so long as freedom of choice is preserved, but they are problems and they spill over onto the saving lives question. And here's some things I've learned over the last months. In nations that have uh, an opt-out regime, presumed consent, as it's sometimes called, or deemed consent, the data is not as supportive of the proposition that presumed content, consent save lives as might be anticipated. The data is very murky. And to get an entree into the, uh, the, the, the intuition, even under a presumed consent regime, typically the next of kin, the family, has a role in deciding what's going to happen. And if the, the chooser, so to speak, the donor, hasn't indicated his or her intentions, the next of kin is going to be A, uncertain about what signal to take from the silence, and B, put in an ethically and emotionally extremely difficult position. So let's add to the mix of chooser autonomy and saving lives. The family under very vulnerable circumstances is being put under opt out, if it's nothing else is done, into a, a really hard position. Now, if the family doesn't have a role in deciding what happens, then opt out turns into routine removal and nobody wants that. Okay, the evidence we've investigated is actually on reflection, extremely unclear on the question whether opt out saves lives. It's very unclear. We've spent a great deal of time on this and to defend the proposition that internationally more people live than die under opt out compared to opt in, it's hard. That's not to say that 
it's proven otherwise. The absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, but we don't have good data demonstrating that opt-out in the countries that have tried it are saving lives. As of an upshot, I think what we'd say is that of the three investigated so far, so far this gets a, a, a check mark combined with a question mark. It's better than the other two because in principle it should save lives. In terms of chooser autonomy, it's pretty good. It's at least as good as opt-in and there are reasons to think it's better, but it's not getting a standing ovation yet. Mandatory choice is the fourth of the five options. And at first glance, it seems best at least of the four so far, better than routine removal, better than opt-in and better than opt-out. The reason is it's a star performer in terms of chooser autonomy. It should be better than either opt-out or opt-in on that ground because people are making an active choice, which is to say if they're becoming organ donors or not, it's a result of their explicit focus on the question. It's not a product of inadvertence or procrastination. The only thing that could be said with respect to chooser autonomy that cuts the other way kind of, is what if people don't want to choose? They're, they're being forced to choose. And that is a kind of footnote, maybe a little worse than that, against the proposition that mandatory choice protects autonomy. But it's looking really good on that count. And on a reasonable hunch about how mandatory choice will work, it should do really well in terms of saving lives, potentially better than opt out for reasons that I hope should now be clear. The family's in a less bad position because there's clear indication of what the uh, chooser wants. And under the reasonable assumption that if really put to it, the vast majority of people will say yes, not necessarily true, but a reasonable empirical hunch, it will do pretty well in terms of making organs available. Okay, a challenge for the proposition that number four is the winner is some data from Nobel Prize winner Al Roth, formerly of Harvard, who finds that empirically changing from opt-in to mandatory cho choosing actually doesn't increase organ donation rates. It just doesn't. And it might have a negative effect on the donation decisions of the next of kin. Now, this is just one study, not clear what to make of it. It does support the following proposition that mandatory choice also gets a check mark. It's a very reasonable contender. It's superb in terms of chooser autonomy. It's probably better in terms of respect for families, their emotions and their um, uh, burdens. But in terms of saving lives, it might actually be, uh, uh, be no better than uh, opt-in. At least Roth's data is suggestive of that. Okay, our fifth on the list is prompted choice. And uh, Thaler and I, with fear and trembling and without, you know, um, uh, tremendous confidence, but at least on my part, I shouldn't speak for him, without tremendous confidence, but with a degree of conviction, we think prompted choice is best. It's going to be adorned. So prompted choice is best because it's fully respectful of chooser autonomy. Prompted choice isn't mandatory choice. If people don't choose, nothing terrible happens. They can't, uh, they're not gonna be stopped from completing a driver's license form, but they're going to be prompted to choose. The idea is that's as respectful of chooser autonomy as anything we've got. It actually respects choosers who choose not to choose. We don't think they're likely to choose not to choose if they're prompted enough. It should save lives, it's gentler. And Roth's own data shows that prompted choice significantly increases the percentage of people who are likely to add themselves to the registry, like a massive increase in addition to the registry, suggesting that prompted choice, if the prompt is clear and salient and repeated, is likely to be quite effective in terms of increasing organ donor registration. The same study shows providing information about organ donation under prompted choice 
increases registration rates. Now, prompted choice to be life-saving and to do very well on that dimension ought to be supplemented by an assortment of nudges, such as media campaigns. In Brazil, a football team did that with a video at home matches, encouraging fans to sign up. And the result was to produce 65,000 signups and reduce the wait list for a certain kind of transplant in the city to zero. Uh, Belgium and Flanders have been a pioneer in nudging of this sort with uh, coordinated efforts to make convenient uh, completing organ donation forms to advertise it, an effort that produced tens of thousands of new registrations, an amazing accomplishment considering what had previously been a quite small number. There's a lot to be done with respect to the East framework from the United Kingdom, easy, attractive, social, and timely, that could turn prompted choice in an engine for life-saving. So the upshot, I'm just about done, is to say that if we look through our set of options with the focus on chooser autonomy and life-saving, with a bow in the direction of protection fam of families under very difficult circumstances. Uh, routine removal is blocked for understandable reasons. It's terrible on chooser autonomy. Opt-in is pretty well blocked if uh, unadorned. It's terrible on saving lives and it's much less good than it seems in terms of chooser autonomy. Remember inertia and procrastination. Uh, opt out is on the table, certainly, but care must be taken to ensure that it does what it's supposed to above all, which is to save lives and without compromising chooser autonomy by turning people into inadvertent or unintentional um, organ donors. If it were, then it would be not good on choose our autonomy grounds, and it would put families in bad positions and potentially not save lives. Mandatory choice also gets a check mark. It's very good on choose our autonomy. It's a big winner, Olympic gold or silver there. And in terms of saving lives, it should in principle work well. Such data as we have suggests uh, question marks. Prompted choice is the winner if the analysis thus far is right not by a lot. It might need a recount. It might do a little bit better in Georgia than opt out, but opt out is a contender still in Georgia and internationally. If prompted choice is the winner, it's because it has um, a, a real triumph, a triumph in terms of chooser autonomy. It's great in terms of protection of families. Uh, in this, you know, searingly difficult position. And if accompanied by nudges that make prompted choice into something very different from opt-in, it ought to be saving a lot of human lives. Thanks. Thank you very much. A great way to set the table on this. Uh, I, I shared with the professor that I'm auditing his course uh, this year. His his co-teacher and spouse, Ambassador Samantha Power, suggested that Nudge should officially be his middle name. Um, so from now on, it should be Cass N. Sunstein. Uh, but I, I really very much appreciate you setting the table. And now we're gonna turn to a couple of folks who are in the process of trying to navigate this architecture um, and who have different views on, on the various, the menu that you've presented to us. Um, and, and first, we're going to turn to Phil Walton, who's from the uh, National Health Service Blood and Transplant Division in the UK, who's been responsible for implementing uh, the deemed consent law in the United Kingdom. And let me just turn it over to you, Phil, to uh, share with all of us uh, what you've been up to uh, in both Wales and in England recently with respect to uh, addressing uh, the decision-making process for organ donation. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I was so just to give a bit of background from myself in terms of uh, I was uh, one of the operational leaders when Wales went live with uh, deemed consent legislation back in 2015, and we learned a whole lot of uh, kind of good and and bad practices from that, which we've been able to bring into the English experience uh, when the law changed 
uh, earlier this year in, in May 2020. Well, I think it's important to, to say, and I think Professor Sunstein has, has given a good overview from an opt-out point of view, but it's obviously laced with nuance and the donation conversations are particularly um, important for us. Um, we've got a, a, a workforce that is extremely talented, sensitive, compassionate, and I think that's really important in bringing out the conversation with, uh, with the donor family. So I'm going to just share with you how we... Um, introduce uh, organ donation and what it has done to um, the way that we, we practice in the UK. So only three slides to share and hopefully we will present. There we go. So broadly the English and Welsh legislations are pretty similar. So I just wanted to share with you the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So in England or Wales, uh, all adults um, living in England or Wales for at least 12 months will be considered to be an organ donor after the, after their death. And of course, they have to have lived in either, or they have to have died, sorry, in either England or Wales um, for that to, for that uh, deemed consent legislation to apply for them. So adults living in England or Wales for at least 12 months before their death and they have to die in England or Wales. The legislation does not apply to, and this is really important in respect of safeguards, um, making sure that the family is center, central to the donation conversations, um, is that donation, uh, the deemed consent legislation doesn't apply to under 18s. It will not apply to those who lack the capacity to have understood the change for a period of 12 months before their death. And anybody that's a transient uh, resident of either England or Wales, so students, or people here on holiday or anything like that, they can't have their consent deemed. They have to be here ordinarily and voluntarily for at least 12 months. And finally, and I think this is, this is one of the things that's uh, missed sometimes in the way that the legislation is, uh, is discussed, is that you cannot have your consent deemed if you've made a donation decision, either to opt in or to opt out. So how this works in practice is we've, there's four very easy steps here. So um, we've got step one, which is all about kind of the referral to the organ donation services team. It's an approach to the family with a specialist nurse or specialist requester. So SNOD is specialist nurse organ donation. So um, just so you're orientated to what that means or SR is specialist requester. From here, we'll move into step two where the, spe where the specialist nurse will establish whether there is an express decision. So an express decision is not mandated how that takes place. So you can opt in on the organ donor register or opt out on the organ donor register, but you can also express verbally to your family one way or the other, and that carries the same legal weight. And that is primary, uh, the primary thing that the specialist nurses will be undertaking with the initial uh, steps in the donation conversation with the family is if their loved one had ever expressed a decision that they wanted to donate. If there, is, if there is an acknowledgement that there has never been a discussion about organ donation, they never knew what they would have wanted, then we'll move into as trying to establish whether consent can be deemed. So that will mean um, uh, let me just try and think what I was trying to say there. So um, can consent be deemed is um, do the exclusion criteria apply? So are they over 18? Did they have medical capacity and are they ordinarily resident? Um, and if they fulfill the inclusion criteria right there, it will be presented to the family that the lack of uh, a registration presents uh, uh, no objection to being a donor. And it will be said in those types of words that we, we will consider it that they have no objection to donation. If however, we have somebody who's under 18 or is temporarily a resident of, of England, then we will take consent from the family if the, cons if the family um, agree that that's what they, they want to do. So everyone else falls into step four. And I think just this is the final slide, just finally, and I think again, Professor Sunstein did, uh, did acknowledge this, that there isn't a great deal of evidence um, in the, the effectiveness of deemed consent or opt-out legislation. Um, but I think in Wales, we were one of the first countries to really put together a study at the time that the legislation was being developed and rolled out. And we're only five years from that implementation. So when we talk about a mass behavior change project, we're still in the very early stages. But just to orientate you to these graphs and primarily to the one on the left of your screen, which is the 
uh, consent rate for donation after brain death. We provided a study or we set up a study that looked at 12 consecutive quarters after the legislation went live in Wales and we plotted the consent rate um, for each of those quarters. We compared the Welsh consent rate to the English consent rate as the default and obviously England at the time was an opt-in system. And we can see from DVD that over a period of time, the consent rate started to just creep up and up and up. And then we, when we got to quarter 11, we were able to breach into the upper section, which de demonstrates a statistically significant increase in consent rate for donors after brain death. That is the statistical significance is 10% or more. And we've maintained that. You can see for DCD, and there are lots of uh, issues that come with DCD consent, whether you're in an opt-in or an opt-out system, but um, we didn't see the same increase from, from a DCD perspective. But what we can say is that there was an increase in, in DVD consent rates, but also the impact of the opt-out legislation is not immediate. So we have gone live in um, England in May of this year, and uh, we're still in the early phases of understanding the success of that. I'll stop there. Oh, thanks, Phil. Just a quick clarification. Uh, DCD refers to death after cardiac death versus death after brain death was the, the chart on the left-hand side. Correct, yeah. So, for those who aren't as deeped into this as some of us. Um, so what, just uh, in sort of summary form, what, uh, what, were the what were the sort of unique challenges? What, were, what surprised you about the implementation of, of uh, deemed consent in, in Wales and now in England that um, you perhaps weren't expecting? Okay, so, uh, well, the, the, the challenges were very different actually. I think um, for, for Wales, we were working in perhaps even un under a hostile spotlight. We were the first country in the United Kingdom to go live with the legislation. And so everyone was taking a, a really watchful eye over what it was going to do. Uh, there were some people in uh, the donation transplant communities that were perhaps not a big fan of uh, whether opt-out should have been brought in. So we had to overcome those, those issues. Um, so, but that paved the way from an England point of view that we didn't have that hostile spotlight. And actually our, our challenges were far more uh, practical because uh, our law went live in England on the 20th of May, 2020, which uh, there was a, like a, a global pandemic happening at that point. So it was uh, rather difficult to um, kind of get our marketing messages out there amongst all the public safety messages and, and, and all of that. So uh, yeah, I, I'd say they were our key challenges. Well, thank you very much. Um, now we're going to be joined by Alexander Glazier, the CEO of the New England uh, Donor Services, um, uh, a very highly regarded uh, organ procurement organization. Uh, your region and the rest of the United States operate on an opt-in uh, format for organ donor registry. Um, how does the process work here and what do you see as the advantages of the U.S. approach? Right, great. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm here to give a little bit of the boots on the ground um, experience for how organ donation does operate within the U.S. And I would say that we have an opt-in system, but per Professor Sunstein, it's really adorned that it is close to a prompted choice or in some circumstances really could be regarded as, as prompted choice. You know, before I get into that, I think I just want to take a second and pause and say it's really important to these kinds of discussions to recognize that organs are not produced, they're not collected, um, they're donated. And they're donated by people in raw human moments that occur when a family is facing an unexpected tragic death. So, you know, while it's obvious to all of us um, having this conversation that there can be no transplantation without donation, it's really worth saying that out loud and remembering that uniquely donation is a community activity um, and the successful engagement of the community is how donation happens it's how transplantation happens so you know with that it's really an incredible privilege and very humbling to do this work on a daily basis and to see the best of humanity in the most difficult of times that people who are willing to help others they don't know but that they know are in need. And so all of this conversation really does start with the donor and individual making, making a decision depending on uh, the choice architecture and, and also the donor family. And so, you know, need to keep that in mind as we discuss various policy options um, 
in a more academic and, and intellectual light. So here in the US, engagement, that engagement with the public is facilitated through an opt-in system, although as I already mentioned, I would say that it's um, an adorned opt-in system and uh, it, it really could be categorized as a prompted choice. The legal framework for donation, and I, I just want to mention that, um, is important because um, it's governed in the US by state law, the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act. And it's uniform to ensure legal consistency from state to state on how organ donation can be accomplished. But this is a really important point to understanding why our opt-in system in the US has been functioning as highly as it does. Um, there's clarity in the law under the UAGA, which is important because it provides certainty for organizations like mine that we need to rely upon when um, we're going to coordinate an anatomical gift in critically short periods of time after an individual has died and been identified uh, with potential donation opportunity. The fact that the UAGA is built on gift law and not informed consent principles is really important to understanding the opt-in functioning within the US and why it works so well. And you know, in part, this is because gift law allows for a very simple process of opting in. At the time of your license renewal, you can say yes to donation. That's the prompted choice. Um, you can do it online at registerme.org, as millions of Americans have. Um, you can do it on your iPhone, um, 30 seconds in the, in the health app. And this process from the law's perspective of authorizing a gift, not being an informed consent process, um, it's not designed to be one. It doesn't need to be one under the UAGA. And this enables a very simple opt-in mechanism from a legal and operational perspective within the US. And I think generally people, especially healthcare providers, are very surprised to hear this news that it's gift law and not informed consent because the paradigm of informed consent, you know, is how healthcare decisions are authorized on a daily basis in our healthcare system, a facilitated understanding of risks and benefits. Um, but what the UAGA did is construct a legal framework with gift law rather than informed consent in recognition of the fact that organ donation, deceased organ donation, there's neither risks nor benefits to the donor, right? There's neither risks nor benefits because the donor is going to be deceased when the donation takes place. And so this simple gift law process uh, is really all that's necessary to effectively and very efficiently carry out organ donation in our opt-in system. Um, so why are we considering or would we consider opt-out or deemed consent or presumed consent? And the answer to this is simple and, it, and it's already been discussed, which is we're not yet meeting the need. There's a gap, there's an organ shortage. We have 110,000 people in the country waiting for transplant, many who die waiting on a daily basis. And so we have a significant public health crisis in the organ shortage. And while our US system outperforms almost every country worldwide, and I'm gonna show some data on that, we have to continually seek to do better. That's our responsibility. And part of that is then evaluating and reevaluating various strategies uh, that could increase donation and transplantation. And so the question is, would, would opt out do better in the US? The three rationale usually cited, and this really aligns with what was laid out by Professor Sunstein is, um, you know, why would we consider going to an opt-in in the US? The three rationale are number one, an assumption that more lives would be saved, that it would in fact increase donation. Number two, that opt-out policy really bridges that gap between intent and action. And again, already, already discussed, but to echo that, meaning that setting up a default would really capture individuals who aren't moved to register, not because they don't want to be donors, but because of inertia, procrastination, or whatever it is. And then the third rationale, also uh, addressed in a different way, but um, similar concept that can be cited for going to an opt-out within the US is that it, there's a signaling effect that this normalizes organ donation in a way that would be overall beneficial to the consent rates. So I want to quickly just share some data to show um, each of those three rationales and, and how we've evaluated that and ultimately come to the conclusion that it would not in fact increase donation in the US and could very well decrease it. So what you're looking at here um, is uh, uh, 10 different countries and 
they're color coded, orange being opt out, blue being opt in. And you can see a rate, this is deceased donors per 10,000 deaths using 2019 data where the sources are referenced at the bottom there. And, um, you know, you can see visually that the U.S. Is, is all the way to the right, second only to Spain, and that the countries are kind of evenly distributed. And again, this echoes what the professor said earlier in the presentation, that the data is not so clear, even though intuitively you would think that opt-out would result in more donors. In fact, the data and the evidence do not show that. Um, and so here, you know, we can see it visually also um, in an article published in JAMA using 2018 data, an article I put together with my co-author Tom Moan, we actually found that opt-in jurisdictions uh, have a 27% higher donation rate than opt-out. And we define jurisdictions to include individual states because again, in, within the US, it's state law that governs the legal framework for organ donation. And many states within the US are in fact larger by population uh, than some of the countries that are reported. So, you know, this really brings me then, if it's not necessarily going to increase the donation rate, seeing where the US has already achieved in its adorned prompted choice opt-in, then the question is, you know, will it bridge that gap or intent? And so just a, a quick, um, overview of um, what the system looks like. You can see here that the choice architecture that we have has two opportunities. One, an individual can authorize themselves through the donor registry, and there's 170 million, 170 million registered donors in the U.S. today. That's about 55 percent of the adult population. So this has been, a, again, a very effective and efficient way for individuals to, to make that selection. Um, but there's a second opportunity as well, and this is sort of where we go with the fact that it's an adorned opt-in, is that the surrogate or the family can make this decision uh, at the time that an opportunity presents. And you can see here in the middle of this graphic that only about 2% of inpatient deaths have the medical opportunity for organ donation. And so that's one of the very large rate limiting factors that people may not be familiar with. If an individual is identified as a potential donor, then again, either they have made that decision previously through the registry uh, or their surrogate can make that decision for them. And that's important to that second point about bridging the gap with intent, because if an individual doesn't make a decision, the surrogate is approached. And that then bridges that gap between intent, those who actually went to register, and action because we allow for the opportunity for someone who didn't take that action, whether it be uh, inertia or, or procrastination or indifference at the moment, um, we allow then the surrogate to take that action for them at the time that an opportunity is actually being presented for a donation to occur. So, you know, I think then the last point just to address is the signaling effect and, and normalizing organ donation. And, yeah, this is really important to talk about because we're not starting from scratch. Um, we're, we're a country that's already well underway with a donation system that's decades old with a adorned opt-in. And, um, you know, you have to fly the plane while you're changing the wing if you want to change the wing. And here's a point to make. The culture within the U.S. is particularly well aligned with opt-in. Americans simply don't want the government deciding to take their organs without asking. And, you know, we're a country that's founded on autonomy principles and we really prioritize individual rights. Um, and that aligns well with our opt-in system. I, I think I can give, you know, no better example than this. If you think about what's happened in the US um, with the government suggesting that individuals wear masks, not only for the benefit of others, but actually also for their own health and well-being. And that has not been, as we know, particularly well received. But more to the point in the donation context, there was a recent Gallup poll, 2019, this had about 10,000 participants that found that up to 37% uh, indicate that they would opt out. And this would be very concerning because it would in fact decrease 
the rates we're currently achieving. So I think, you know, while the rationale for considering moving to presumed consent is definitely well intentioned and should be continually evaluated, when you peel it back and you look at the data, uh, it could certainly result in a drop to the U.S. donation rate. Where the U.S. is performing now um, is, you know, outperforming really almost every country um, out there. And there are no examples in the data of a country performing at the level the U.S. is currently achieving and switching to opt out and seeing improved performance. And as Professor already mentioned, there are examples of countries um, seeing a decrease. The Netherlands is one, I believe, about 31% of uh, the population opted out when this switch happened. So, you know, with a culture that is deeply steeped in individual rights with the many laws and societal norms that we have prioritizing individual autonomy, um, we're really well suited, I think, for our adorned, prompted choice architecture that we have for organ donation. And um, I think, you know, when you talk to Spain, which is the opt-out country that outperforms the U.S., they say and have published, the leadership has published on this topic, that they don't believe their opt-out policies are responsible for the success because they ask for family permission in all instances. And so what Spain attributes its success to is strategies that focus on well-funded systems that um, are supported with excellent hospital engagement and operational components that are really what's needed to make organ donation successful. And, and that resonates with me as an executive running an OPO here in the region. Um, those kinds of strategies have grown organ donation very significantly in our region and, and nationally. And this is my last slide, which is that, um, you know, since 2012, there's been a 46% increase in organ donation in the U.S. And this is fantastic. But, you know, we also recognize that the urgency is there, that more still needs to be done. Um, this isn't a system that's broken, but it's one that we want to continually to optimize. And we think we can do that within a, an opt-in um, choice architecture with sort of bolstering our prompted choice operational components of this system. And I think, you know, there's ways we can do that to increase the numbers that actually register to increase our ability to move forward with organ donation when an individual has registered, um, even in the face of a family objection. And, you know, so for these reasons, I wouldn't advocate for changing our prompted choice opt-in system, uh, but it's not the same as concluding there's nothing else that can be done. And we know that there are things that can be done to continue to increase U.S. authorization rates and improve the rates of organ donation. Um, saving lives through donation and transplantation is a, a public health endeavor. And so long as the, you know, there is unmet need, um, continual performance improvement is the strategy that we must employ. So always looking for ways that, that we can continue that work. And I think I'm going to stop sharing because that's my last slide. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me just very quickly pose some questions um, to uh, Phil that have come up on the um, chat. And then Professor Sunstein, if you want to offer some thoughts, I certainly would very much welcome them. We have a couple, so this, this is the lightning round. There's some quick questions for you, uh, Phil, in particular, about what the experience has been. Has opt-out been adopted in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well, or is it just England and Wales? I think you're muted, Phil, sorry. I am, I, I'm a pro at muting myself, yeah. Um, so the Scotland are due to go live with their deemed authorization uh, on the 26th of March, 2021. So they're in the process of kind of training their staff and communicating and marketing around that. Northern Ireland are just starting the conversation, in fact, um, around uh, themed legislation for, for Northern Ireland. So that will be some years off yet, but they, uh, they've started the conversation and that's moving in, the, in that direction. Some very knowledgeable folks have posed the question of, of, of sort of two related things from two different uh, questioners. One is, how important was it that it was named after Max and Kira in garnering public support and media attention? On the, uh, that's one question, and, and on a broader level, how 
uh, to what extent do you think that the improvement in rates may have had as much to do with some of the public relations efforts and other media uh, efforts that you've undertaken? Okay, so if I start with Max and Kira, just to give some context for uh, colleagues across the pond. Uh, Kira Ball was a, a nine-year-old girl who died in a, in a car accident. Her heart was donated into nine-year-old Max Johnson. Um, Max became the face of a public campaign by one of our national newspapers. And um, the story really gained traction. They, his, his, uh, his health was deteriorating before, uh, before a heart became available. And he, him and his family have done just some, some amazing stuff around promotions. And I think what we see with all marketing campaigns is that real stories mean something and you put yourself in those situations. So uh, Max and Kira were, were, you know, enormously valuable to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the, the journey that we went on for England. How successful or how much do we attribute opt-out legislation to some of the successes? I think what... You know, Opt-out legislation is not a panacea to all of this. It's not the golden bullet. I think it comes as part of the jigsaw puzzle that supports um, organ donation in general. So without the legislation, we wouldn't have had a marketing budget. We wouldn't have had the opportunities to bring people to the table from clinical sides to faith and belief groups to um, uh, or, or any of the resources or the additional money that came our way. So I think there are the legislation does help and I think we do see it in donation conversations, particularly where families are unsure about what their loved one would have wanted. Uh, the, the organ donation law does provide a structure that supports them to support donation, but that's not the only thing that helps. And I think the, the opportunity around the legislation with the funding uh, and everything that that brings to the, to the discussion really has made a difference. Um. So, oh, Professor Sensing, you had appeared uh, momentarily a, go, a little while ago on the screen. I didn't know if you wanted to offer some thoughts after hearing from your co-presenters. Uh, if, if that's for me, I'm having a little instability on the on the internet. But uh, I thought these comments were extremely instructive, um, and uh, so my my reflection is that. Uh, the difference between opt-in and opt-out is actually less sharp and stark than it might seem. If, if opt-in is accompanied by a lot of prompting, et cetera, as Alexandra suggested, the chance that it will do well on the margins along which it's criticized increases significantly. And if opt-out is run in a way that Phil has described, in a way that's attentive to families and attentive to chooser wishes, it is responding to the concerns of those who think that chooser autonomy will be violated and you won't really save lives. So it's interesting that two of the contenders for uh, you know, uh, adoption, they tend to coalesce in, if implementation details are done right. And, and sort of following up on that, uh, this is for you, Alex, um, just to clarify, when you have first person consent, when someone is actually on the registry or some other ways evidence their interest in being an organ donor, do you still require family authorization for a donation to proceed? And do you, do you see families uh, trying to withhold authorization uh, notwithstanding the first person consent? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is we do not ask for family authorization if an individual has authorized themselves through the registry. That's not the same as saying we exclude the family from the process because of course they're a critically important part of the process. We need to explain what's going to happen. We need to get a medical social history. We need to answer questions they may have, you know, and help support them through, you know, what is an incredibly complicated and emotional moment. Um, but from a legal perspective, we are not asking permission. And I think one of the legal and ethical advantages of having an opt-in that is so clear like the US through the UAGA is you know, that there's some confidence that this was what the individual wanted, it was their choice, and we can respect their autonomy by following through. Certainly the least we can do in an opt-in system from my perspective is make sure that organ donation happens every time that there's a medical opportunity for it to happen and the individual has said that they want to be a donor. And so, you know, we're not asking for family permission. If the family does object, which is a very rare circumstance, but it's not never, it, it happens, you know, then I think 
OPOs throughout the country um, generally work to still make that donation happen together with the support of the donor hospital where the event is occurring. Of course, I'm going to give a lawyer answer, which is it depends, um, you know, in terms of whether the case can move forward, but it, but it almost always does. And what would it depend on? Well, we want to make sure that the donor registration was valid, for example, um, and that, you know, there wasn't a, an error or things of that nature. And also that the, uh, the donation opportunity would result in a transplant. You know, clearly, we're doing all of this to save lives. And so that evaluation to make sure that the benefit intended by the individual who registered would actually be realized is, is a key piece of how our organization would then move forward. Uh, Phil, back to you, another uh, quick question was posed, which is uh, someone was curious about why Dean consent did not posit positively impact consent rates for uh, death after circulatory, uh, a, a donation after circulatory death, which I think I incorrectly characterized earlier. But um, any, any insights as to why it doesn't seem to have as much impact now? Well, I, th I think just, I, I, I'm sure, I think Alex will see this as a, a similar um, trend in the, in the States as well, that donation after circulatory death, just the very nature of how, how it's conducted um, and the, the circumstances in which you arrive at that position, um, consent often just falls behind what you would see for donation after 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 brain death. Um, with with brain death um, uh, donors, you have a, a a diagnosis of death up front in front of the family. You can provide a level of assurance that that their loved one has already died. And I think with with DCD donors, um, they have not at the time that donation conversations are taking place. Those their loved ones have not died and will only die shortly before being taken into the operating room. So there is a, a, a mixed picture with that. And I think that, that uh, really does influence the, the decision-making with families. Yeah, I would just add on to that from the U.S. perspective, you know, the way I look at it, that there's a, a decision that needs to be made first in DCD, which is the withdrawal of the ventilator. That decision is not wrapped up in the donation decision in the sense that registering as a donor, opting in, as a donor doesn't also authorize withdrawal of care in that circumstance. So the family still or surrogate decision maker needs to make that decision. And it's a clinical condition for organ donation to then go forward. But I would say this, under the UAGA in the US law, how death is declared is not relevant to the donation authorization itself. You authorize donation after you die the mechanism for how death is declared is, is not specific, nor should it be, because this is really about coordination of a donation after a death. So, uh, Professor Sunstein, we're almost at uh, the close of the hour, but I'm happy to give you uh, what may be the last word. Okay, well, I, I thought this was really a sensational discussion. Very grateful to Phil and Alexandra. Uh, I think we have paths forward both for opt-in and for out, opt-out regimes. So as Alexandra convincingly showed, the opt-in regime in the United States has many virtues associated with it, but too many people are dying. And the question is, what are we going to do about that to prevent preventable deaths? And Phil is, you know, heroically overseeing something that could be a model for the world. And the question is, which he's clearly on top of, is how can we maybe for the first time run an opt-out regime in a way that uh, is firmly attentive to the concerns of those who think it is either not going to work or not sufficiently respectful of choosers? All right, unless anyone has a burning last word they wish to offer, I, 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 we are remarkably um, uh, I think I've covered the waterfront, at least as one best can in an hour of conversation. Um, I should um, alert folks that there may be a follow-up uh, blog post from um, our two uh, presenters uh, who uh, you've just heard from uh, to talk a little bit further about this. So we, we'd like to continue this conversation. Um, and again, I, I thank all of our presenters for their participation in this program and, uh, and all those who have uh, who, who have uh, enjoyed listening to it with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.